in Sumerian and Akkadian cultures from Mesopotamia thousands of years ago. They're what was known as gala priests. They were often men who took on feminine roles and dressed as women, with some even undergoing forms of castration. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Tattoo Preacher Podcast. This is episode number 58. Hope you are all doing awesome. Today on this episode, we're going to be talking about a few different things. We're going to be talking about the fact that Hollywood is dying. The influence that Hollywood has on people is dying, and I think that's amazing. We're going to be looking at... My thoughts around the LGBTQ movement and why I think it's more, it's less of a movement and more like a cult. So I'm going to be just diving into that a little bit. And then I want to conclude just by talking about just, I was reading the story about the crucifixion this week, Jesus dying on the cross. And there is just one element of the story that I've read a thousand times, but it just really struck me. Um, So I'm going to chat about that to conclude the episode. So that's where we're going today. Hope that interests you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. All right, so the first thing I want to chat about is the amazing reality that Hollywood is dying. The election just took place actually a week ago yesterday was election night. And obviously, we all, we all know that Trump won. Go Trump. And one of the craziest um, bits of information that came from the campaign of Harris was the fact that you know, they spent like a billion dollars on their campaign. A billion dollars. Like we can't can't even fathom how much that is. A billion dollars in 107 days. And millions of that was devoted to endorsements. And so it's come out where she gave something like 10 million bucks to Beyonce. $10 $10 million for her to come out, give some kind of endorsement speech. She gave, I think it was like $1.8 million to Eminem. And she just gave millions of dollars to these celebrities to endorse her. Now, when we're talking about endorsements, it's not, it's, it's been a typical strategy for certain candidates for, for decades. I mean, every, every election, you're going to have, you know, the, quote unquote, celebs coming out to try to sway the public. And I think for, you know, a a lot of years that, that worked. But something happened in this recent election that I think it was, was just amazing was like America didn't care about what celebrities tried to feed them. They didn't care. Beyonce, J-Lo, Oprah, Eminem. Can't remember who they had. I can't, uh, I forget the name. <clears throat> some group doing some, some dance recital on stage. America didn't care because the result was a landslide. So it really wouldn't have mattered if they had, if she had all these endorsements or not. The point was this, this, influence this this political influence of hollywood is is like is 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 done people could not care less what these celebrities have to say and i think it's like uh, it's like it's like finally maybe it's always been there or like within recent years but finally it it, it they like 
the voters, the, the voting public actually stood up, came to the polls and like, let their vote be heard where it was like, we're not going to let millionaires, billionaires come up there, feed us a bunch of stuff to try to get us to, to sway our vote. It's like the people saw through this, the, the democratic campaign nonsense. And all, all of these celebrities threatening to leave. I mean, this is the, they did this, what, eight years ago when, when Trump was first elected, Trump wins, we're going to leave America. And everyone was just like, okay, like, bye, go. And so the same thing happened again. Trump wins, we're leaving. And these, like, these emotional speeches, these, these endorsements, just, they had no effect. And so I think it was like, it, it just, it really brought out to the surface now how the general public really feels about Hollywood, about these celebrities, how irrelevant they are, how, how much of the fact that they just have no influence on an average person's everyday life. And the thoughts and the ideas and the opinions of celebrities, people who can act, people who can sing, like people are just like, who, I don't care what they think. Why is a famous person who can act going to instruct me on how to vote? It's like these people, they're in like the 0.5% percentile of like the wealthy people. Everyone else cannot relate to them, cannot connect with them, doesn't have the same affordability, the, 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 like the same resources. It's like, I, I just, and it, it just came to the forefront that, you know what, doesn't matter what these famous people say, no difference. The result of the election was a landslide. And I think that that, it just, it just showed finally showed and i hope it's a good wake up call for quote unquote celebrities hollywood elites that people just don't care like your voice your opinion is no more significant than anyone else's and the fact that what you have millions of dollars and you can act or you can sing or whatever you can play a sport or just because you have a good ability at that doesn't make you a political influence in the everyday lives of the public. Like there's a good, good dose of like some humility and good dose of reality. It's a, re it's a massive reality check because we're like, we've already gone into this age, the social media age is like celebrity that, that term has just lost so much meaning because you have so many random everyday people who are crazy influencers and who garner just as much influence as these A-list Hollywood celebrities. When you got TikTokers, you got people on Instagram or whatever with tens of millions of followers who garner so much influence. It's like this, this term celebrity is, is, is just losing all significance because anybody, if you have a cell phone or a computer, you can let your voice be heard. You can voice out your opinions and your conclusions of life and your opinions can travel literally all around the globe. You put out a reel, you put out a TikTok that has the potential to reach every continent. And so it's just like celebrity culture is completely shifting and changing. And I think because of what we've just seen, it's just like out in the forefront now. People just don't give a rip about who a celebrity is and what they think. Um, which I think, I, I, which I, I mean, I think Hollywood's been just putting out nonsense and garbage for years now. But I just think that, I mean, when, like when you look at the Oscars, you look at the Grammys, just the ratings for these shows have gone way down. And, and you just look at, in light of the last, you know, four or five years, the pandemic and the economy and, and people just like struggling to make it and, you know, having to deal with so much. It's like, who cares about the movies? Who cares about, like, it's just the priorities of our world have shifted. 
And so I just, I think it was awesome that, that, that you know, not that millions of dollars were wasted because how, how do you, you spend a billion dollars on your campaign and you're still in debt 20 million, but yet you want to run the country. So the fact that millions upon millions of dollars were wasted is not a good thing, but the silver lining is that it had no bearing on the result. People just did not care. And I think too, it's because the majority of, and I don't know all the specific stats, but the majority of people who vote are older. And so the one concern though, that we have to, as 30, as people who are 30 and up, the one thing we have to con be concerned about is the younger generation, the 18 to 29 year old. And those teenagers who are coming of age, coming of voting age, is that they are the ones who are very impressionable. The adults can see through BS and the adults, you know, aren't moved by the quote unquote celebrities, but the younger generation are. This is why I talk about it a lot on podcasts and on YouTube videos and social media is because there are millions of teenagers, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds, and then on and upwards who are influence it, who do idolize celebrities, people who are just, you know, you know, young kids who are just, who are just starting to vote and, and they see a Beyonce or they see a Taylor Swift or they see Eminem, you know, make these comments and whatever. And, and they're the ones that'll be like, oh, well, my favorite celebrity votes for this person. So maybe I should, this is where, this is the only concern because as that number, as they get older and, and as that number grows that may have an effect on future votes, future elections. And so that's my only caution is that as adults, we have to really help the younger generation. And I think that because we live in social media age, I think a lot more adults, a lot more older people have to start leveraging social media to help. Um, to put out quality content that's geared to help instruct the next generation. Um, and I, and I think that that's one of the ways that we can help the, the next generation make meaningful choices, uh, wise choices and really understand and not be swayed by culture and not be swayed by these quote unquote celebrities. Um, and so that's my encouragement, um, to you listening or watching if you're older as, as you know, time goes on, uh, leverage, use your, whatever influence you have. I don't care how many followers you have. You may not even be on social media. Just, it's not hard to set up an account and just use it as a way to help the next generation when it comes to big cultural issues you know, like an election and things like that. And so I think that's one of the ways we can help. Um, so, but yeah, I just, I just felt like it was, I love, I loved it. I love seeing the fact that America didn't care. They weren't going to be swayed. They weren't going to be manipulated and, uh, millions of dollars could not buy their vote. And, um, I just thought that was really, really Awesome. All right, moving on. So the next thing I wanted to just chat about quickly was my thoughts surrounding this LGBTQ plus plus whatever, whatever it is now movement. And, you know, for so long when we, we, we hear about this, I mean, I've done a lot of videos on this. It, it's been, it's become so immersed in our culture, especially the last 10 years. And it's often framed as this, you know, movement of this, 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 this minority of people who have decided that, that their identity should be X, Y, Z now, that it's, it's more of like these people are identifying with, with 
becoming more open and real with themselves and it's this minority of people and this is how they're identifying. LGBTQ plus plus, I think there's a Q in there now or two Qs or whatever it is. And that's just kind of how it's, it's and, and the rest of society is, is we're just supposed to just accept it, take it, no matter how ridiculous it is, no matter how detrimental it is, uh, we're just supposed to accept it. And so it's this massive push of, of acceptance of they want equal rights and laws and policies geared towards them. And, but as I've been thinking about this recently, I just, I feel like it's not a movement. It's not an identity. What it really is behind the scenes, if you're looking at it at, at its foundational level, it's, it's a cult. It's a cult. So I did a little bit of digging. And when you look at ancient religion for the last thousands of years, this whole idea, especially of, of trans, the whole trans movement is not a modern thing. It's not like people just woke up in, you know, recent decades and been like, you know what, let's just, I, I want to identify as, as this, this, this modern revelation of society. It's been around for thousands of years. For example, like for example, in Sumerian and Akkadian cultures from Mesopotamia, thousands of years ago, they're what was known as gala priests. In ancient Sumer and Akkad, gala priests served in temples of the goddess Inanna, Ishtar in, in Akkadian culture. They were, they were often men who took on feminine roles and dressed as women, with some even undergoing forms of castration. They performed sacred music and were involved in rituals that honored Inanna, who herself was a deity associated with gender fluidity and transformation. So there was this cult thousands of years ago where you had men who were cutting themselves, castrating themselves so that they could be like women, role reversal. And they would do this in honor in worship of a deity. And then you have ancient Hittite religions, same kind of things happening, ancient Egyptian religions. You had ancient Roman religions, um, the cult of Sibella originating in Persia and later incorporated into Roman religion had the Galli priests who underwent self-castration to fully dedicate themselves to the goddess. Again, this transformation, this gender transformation is like, this is not a new idea. And it was happening in these ancient cults, part of these rituals and ceremonies that were forms of worship to false gods to deities. And so if you look at this whole movement now, it's like there's, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's happened has happened before. It's going to happen again. There may be different words, different terms, but the whole idea, the, the acts and the, the mindset, the behavior, is all, is all the same, is all demonic in nature. And it may not be a ancient like practice, like an ancient cult or as a form of worship to a deity. Those deities, those ancient gods are demonic entities. And those same entities, those same demonic spirits, that, that, that same demonic influence is still here today still influencing culture. And now it's different. It's not like priests in some kind of a temple. It's 
the temple has become society. And you have millions of people, men, women, and now we're pushing it on our children to identify with the same kind of stuff. And it may not be this specific act of worship to a deity, but that deity who is influencing culture, influencing the masses to participate in this kind of behavior, when they see it taking place and when they see men becoming women, women becoming men, when they see the 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 fact that our our children are just getting confused and getting pushed and forced to undergo these transformations and they see all this stuff taking place that is worship to them that's how that's what feeds them that's what empowers them that's what gives them the open doors that's what gives them that that ruling force to interject into a culture and a society. This is all a demonic cult. It's one massive demonic cult that's been perpetuated on our society at large. And it hasn't gone global. There's certain parts of the world where this is not accepted. But North America has become this place where truth is no longer or, or where truth has become subjective. Truth has become whatever you want it to mean. And when there's no outside, um, an outside driven ethic, like for example, God through the Bible, instilling morality onto a culture, something from that's outside of culture itself. There's no external divine ethic. It's now, Ethics have become, truth has just become whatever you want it to be. Whenever that happens in a society and culture where everyone gets to decide what's right for them, this is the result. You get craziness. So in the ancient world, there were certain, you know, localized cults devoted to certain gods. And so you had priests and priestesses. It wasn't like a societal thing. But now... It's grown to be this literal societal push, the societal influence where it's, 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 it's immersed on a culture. And this can only happen once you throw truth out the window, once truth can be whatever you want it to be and no one can tell you otherwise, well, then you've opened the door to anything. Anything goes. And this is why you see like um, this push now for people being people who are identifying as, you know, I'm, I'm a minor attracted now. We're going to have adult and kids. Like, this is the insanity that happens with a culture that has no truth, no, no defined truth, but truth has become subjective. As, we, as, as you have this demonic cultic influence now everywhere, and it's like, Millions of people are getting caught up in it under the guise of being an identity. How I feel on the inside. It's how I was born and all of this stuff. Now, it, you have been immersed into a cult. You've been hoodwinked. You've been deceived. And it's rampant. And it's dark. And it's evil. And it's like, but, that, but that's what happens. And so it's like, it, 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 it's, we ha I don't know the solution coming at this from a Christian perspective. I think it's like, this is where spiritual warfare is huge. It's where we're not battling. It's not, we're not fighting against people. It's the demonic entities behind it. It's spiritual. And so you have to get the, as, as Christians, as the church come together and like, man, battle this stuff in the spirit um you're not battling people i mean you can change policy all you want and which is important you can have i mean in in light of trump getting elected and he's going to come in there and hopefully a lot of the democratic policies that have been instituted and pushed are going to be removed and changed and 
which is fine, but that doesn't deal, it's that, that's one part of it, but that doesn't deal with the root cause of it all. And so that's something that Christianity, Christians, the church got to take seriously, got to, got to figure out a way to attack this spiritually, um, and not just accept it as just a way of, so this isn't, we should never just accept it. It says, this is a demonic cult that's been around for thousands of years and it's just exploded in our culture. The temple has become our culture, not just some low, some specific location that's designed to worship a particular entity. It's become everywhere now. Um, and so we gotta, we gotta join together and figure out a way to break down those strongholds in the spirit. So, but yeah, but that's just some thoughts I've been thinking, um, of how I approach this subject now and, and seeing that it's nothing new. It's been around for thousands of years. This whole idea is nothing new. It's not just some modern thing. It's, it's been around all of it, the whole L G B T Q plus plus whatever it's all been around before it's existed for thousands of years. And so, um, yeah, that's just some thoughts on that. The last thing I wanted to just chat about was, so I'm reading the, the Bible through a year on one of those chronological Bible in a year plans. And so yesterday uh, I was reading about the crucifixion and I was reading in Luke, Luke chapter 23, where Jesus was on the cross and when he was crucified on the cross, there were two thieves crucified along with him. And I mean, I've read this, this story uh, hundreds and hundreds of times, but something just, it just struck me, um, this time reading it. And it just really was just like, just showed like how much Jesus loved people, how much God loves the world. Um, and so in verse chapter 23 verses, let's start from verse 30, 39 it says one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him. So one of the criminals were on the cross hurling abuse at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ save yourself and us? But the other responded and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And I read that and I, and I was just like, it just shows just the, the unending mercy and love and grace that Jesus has for people that God has for the world. The fact that like this criminal, this dude, you know, we don't know much about his life, but he became a criminal. And so we don't know how long he was a criminal, but the point was this, this dude was not a good dude. He did nothing for God, wasn't a follower, wasn't a disciple, wasn't a believer. He was a known criminal that got caught and was now getting, was now receiving judgment for what he did. Wasn't a good dude, did nothing to earn, to merit any kind of mercy or love or grace from Jesus. He's on the cross and he just happens to be beside Jesus on the cross. And, and he just asks him, Jesus, um, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Like you just imagine like th this is, this is it. He's about to die. He knows it's over. There's no tomorrow. It just some last ditch, you know, hail Mary. I mean, 
we don't know what he knows theologically. Was he well versed in the Old Testament? At least, like, we don't know anything. It doesn't seem like it. And Jesus doesn't judge him. He doesn't look down upon him. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't say, well, what did you do for me? You spent none of your life serving God or doing anything. You know, he says, he saw the heart behind what the guy said. And he saw, and he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He deserved death, deserved eternal punishment. But Jesus in his final moments, in his last like breath was like, I got you. I'll save you today. You'll be with me in paradise. And it just, it just struck me. It's just like, we're that guy. We're the criminal. You know, I'm the criminal. There's nothing that I deserve more than to be judged. I didn't deserve love and mercy and grace. But yet, that's what Jesus bestowed upon me through his death on the cross. Through my futile attempt at reaching out for him. And he said, Joel, today you'll be with me in paradise. I got you. And like, that's the heart of Jesus towards the world, towards humanity. So many times we think that we have to like earn God's approval, earn his acceptance, earn his favor. It's a lie. We don't have to earn. You can't earn it. It's a free gift and salvation's a free gift that is just received. And it's just like, it just struck me. He's Jesus. He's on the cross. He's the Bible goes to great lengths to describe. He's been beaten beyond, um, beaten beyond recognition. He's in pain when you're on the cross, like you can't breathe. Like you, like the amount of torture, the amount of bodily pain that you'd be feeling at this moment, we, we, we have no concept of, but yet in that place, in that state, he, he still looked at this criminal and said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He, he, it's in that place where he extended mercy and love and grace. And it just, it just struck me, um, reading it this time that we all deserve death for our sins, but Jesus gave us life and without Jesus, we're nothing without Jesus. We are dead men walking without Jesus. We have no hope without Jesus. We have no purpose, no meaning. Um, Jesus is, Jesus is everything. And this criminal, this thief who's hanging on the cross had one second, one second of, of clarity before he died, where he looked at Jesus and he, no, this man is innocent. Please remember me, Jesus. And Jesus saw his heart. He saw the faith that was there. It wasn't much in his final moments, his final breath before he died. He reached out and Jesus took his hand and saved him. And now that dude is, that dude's in heaven. The other guy mocked him. The other guy, it says he hurled abuse at Jesus. So you have one criminal hurling abuse. You have the other one realizing, shoot, I'm, is, this is it. I need to be saved here. And this guy is the only one that can do it. And so I just want to encourage you. If you're watching this, or you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus, Jesus died for you. Put yourself in that story. We are the thief on the cross. That's who, that's, that's who, who humanity is. We're the thief. We're dying. We're, we are, we all deserve death, eternal punishment. And Jesus has his hand and he's reaching out and he's saying, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. If you receive me. If you acknowledge him as Lord, if you acknowledge him as savior, if you acknowledge Jesus as God. And so reach out to Jesus today. He loves you more than you could ever know. Well, that's it for episode 58 of the Tattooed Preacher podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know. And if you're watching this on YouTube, let me know down below what you think. Uh, 
uh, start a dialogue in the comment section. Have yourself an awesome rest of your day or evening, and we'll see you all in the next episode. Much love and God bless.